We've had uh, three great sessions today featuring education, small business, and, and our agriculture centers. And now we want to touch on a topic that's uh, been extremely important to a great many people and is important in the, um, in the overall approach we have to, uh, to learning, uh, to learning about each other, learning about policy issues, and, uh, and having a, a civic state and national debate. Specifically, we're going to talk about censorship. Um, about censorship in social media and how giants like Facebook and Twitter treat free market ideas and organizations. Paul Guppy is our Vice President for Research at Washington Policy Center. He's been tracking this issue. Uh, Paul, welcome. Uh, thanks for having me. It's been, it's been a great couple of sessions so far, and I'm glad to uh, be part of this with you, Dave. You bet. How, how do you see, you know, overall um, the level of uh, the bias or, you know, I hate to use censorship because censorship is generally considered government uh, squashing of, of free speech. So there's a bit of, um, you know, a, a bit of liberty taken here. But what do you see as the main problem uh, that uh, free market organizations face right now in, in the social media tech world? Well, I'll tell you, it's, it, it's really surprising. It, it just shows how you can never predict the future. <laughs> so uh, during the Cold War, we all thought that Eastern Europe, the Soviet Union uh, had these oppressive societies where the press was controlled and Americans like to say, well, that'll never happen here. I mean, we're not gonna have anything like that. And you're right, we don't have narrowly defined technical government censorship. I mean, there isn't a ministry of information run by uh, tax paid bureaucrats. But in, in a de facto sense, we are evolving into that kind of system because of what's loosely called big tech. And of course, we, kn we know all the big companies that now dominate the internet. And that is a development that was completely unanticipated. But it is a censorship world which is evolving, even though the mechanism is not the traditional kind of, you know, government top-down mechanism. I could, as we got ready for our session, I couldn't resist grabbing my copy of, can you see that? Yeah, 1984, <laughs> which is what people often think of as being, you know, this totalitarian government. We, we don't have that uh, so far in the US, but it, as far as uh, public debate, sharing information, the, able, the ability to share ideas, that is being restricted because of a mechanism that most people hadn't anticipated, and that is the growth of the internet being dominated by particular companies. I'm sure we'll get to this a little bit later on, but what this grew out of is the 1996 uh, Internet uh, Decency Act, Telecommunications and Decency Act, which includes, of course, the Section 230, and, and I don't need to get into all the details of that, or we can, but, but the effect of that has created a regulatory world in which big tech does control much of what appears online and they select the topics that are going to be moderated. And, you know, so there, there are just certain issues where you can't say whatever you like. And to me, the test of free speech is are wacky and even unpopular ideas allowed. So if you wanna, I'm stunned that you can talk about there being a flat earth society. You can talk about conspiracies regarding the moon landing and crazy things like that, which we all admit are crazy, but we don't necessarily need to suppress them. And then when you get up to issues that are more relevant to people's everyday lives that we're dealing with today regarding COVID and other things, there is this moderation. And so that's where we experience censorship, again, in a de facto way, even though it's not being done by some government agency. Tech giants and traditional media outlets will say, well, look, the, the, the center of right uh, claims that there's this censorship going on. And look at, at who the most engaged uh, Facebook um, sites you know, are and, and, and personalities are. Um, look who dominates you know, the Facebook uh, uh, news engagement, and you see just a, a slew of conservative um, and right of center sites, you know, including Ben Shapiro, the Washington Examiner, and, and, and others. Um, so they point to that and say, so there really isn't a complaint there. There's, there's no shutting down of, of conservative voices, and it's really kind of a, 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 a boo-hoo of uh, conservatives who lost. Uh, sure. What's your response to that? 
Well, again, it's selective. So at, from an analyst point of view, I, we look at, at Washington Policy Center, we do this generally, we look at systems in totality. So if you're gonna say that you have unregulated free speech is allowed in the public marketplace, that means everybody gets a voice. But so to cite conservative voices that are allowed to remain, is not an argument for saying that you have free speech and no censorship, because of course you could list just as many people who have been shut down, starting with the president of the United States at one time. You know, uh, Donald Trump has been kicked off Twitter. Uh, Congressman Marjorie Greene, if I got her name right, she was just deplatformed. So uh, you can give lots of examples of voices. And again, the, all the way from the founding era up until today, and the courts have consistently ruled that the First Amendment is to protect unpopular speech or ideas that are controversial or even conspiratorial or edgy, however you wanna describe it. Popular speech doesn't need to be protected. It's, it's, dis, it's alternative dissident voices that need to be protected. And again, from an analyst point of view, the crazier the idea is, the more of a test it is of tolerance, if, if that makes sense. So to point to you know certain conservative voices that are popular, have wide uh, listenership, and are still permitted is not, uh, it, th that isn't a sufficient test. What you want to look for are, are the fringy voices and whether they are allowed to express themselves. That tells you whether you really have a system of free speech or not. A question popped up, Paul, uh, which is, you know, should, does this mean we need to bring back something like the fairness doctrine? Is that what we're calling for? Uh, because that didn't work out so well. Yeah, uh, bad idea, because the fairness doctrine is just another form of censorship. <laughs> OK, because in that case, the government says, well, you have to give X number of minutes to one point of view and then a certain number of minutes to another point of view. And it is a classic speech regulation system. So, again, I'm very familiar with the fairness doctrine where conservatives were allowed six minutes on PBS to answer the liberal point of view or something like that. Um, I, conservatives and Republicans often thought, well, that's better than nothing. You know, at least uh, NBC News is not shutting us out entirely. They have to give us, you know, once a week, they have to give us a few minutes on, on uh, uh, the evening news. But uh, that, in a principled way, that is not free speech. It's just another form of regulation. So the only way to have free speech is to have true competition and free speech. The tech companies, without anybody's real planning, uh, have become monopolies that dominate everything. So we can maybe talk about alternative media, which is also popping up, but that is really the solution where uh, one group of people is, is not saying, we're trying to silence anybody else. We're not trying to pick and choose. We're not trying to regulate the number of minutes that you get to express your views. Instead, we're allowing everybody to speak. And if you don't like what someone else is saying, then present your own argument as well. Uh, next question, how do you balance the right of a company like Twitter to, to conduct business as they wish and the rights of individuals to express, uh, express themselves, express free speech? And this is exactly where Section 230 comes in. OK, so the current system we have was created by Congress in 1996, which gave the tech companies and I worked in Congress at the time, so I'm very familiar with this law. Uh, the concern at the time was that American uh, technology was on the cutting edge of building the internet, which is certainly true. We wanted to maintain that advantage and to encourage innovation. What the tech companies did is they went to the government and said, well, if we can be sued for, if we are held liable for all of the content that is put online, who knows what contributors are gonna put up on YouTube or, or post on their sites. And of course, back then the internet was much more restricted, but still, the, the people providing the content were not the same as the people providing the platform. So this is not like a newspaper or a book publisher who chose what authors to publish and then is responsible for that publication. The argument was made at the time that the uh, tech companies are merely providing a platform. It's a community bulletin board. We're not responsible for what people post up there. Therefore, Congress give us liability protection from being sued. Uh, for, for defamation and a gang of other things. And Congress said, okay, we're gonna protect American a technical advantage by providing section 230. What we have today is the tech companies are, I mean, maybe lawyers would argue it another way, but I don't see how the tech companies on the one hand can say we're moderating, we're moderating content. And then on the other hand say, we're not responsible for the content. 
So, so this is a tension that Congress needs to resolve by reforming Section 230, and I know there are bills to do that. Uh, one option would be to repeal it entirely, and so that anybody who is uh, defamed on the internet through false information can go to court and sue Facebook or Twitter or Amazon or Google or whoever it is. Of course, those tech companies don't want to be exposed to that liability. So the problem we have today is that the tech companies have done what they initially said that they didn't want to do, which is filter and monitor content. But that's exactly what they do today <laughs> with, you know, they have literally tens of thousands of of tech workers who monitor the internet and apply what they call community standards, uh, which is their kind of shifting policy as to what's allowed. And so that's where the problem comes from, is that the government created um, this liability lawsuit protection for the tech companies. And yet today they have moved into this world of where they are monitoring content. That's not how they started out. Paul, how would we encourage, this is a question from Daniel, how do, how do we encourage people to get outside their own bubble? Isn't that part of why we see the heavy polarization today? Yeah, so I, I'm all for that. And, and again, at Washington Policy Center, we are curious and interested in a range of ideas and the widest range of voices possible. Um, you know, our motto is open minds lead to the best ideas. And so we are in favor of vigorous open debate and, and a variety of, of information sources that people have. Uh, the way that we can get that is a couple of things. One is for search algorithms to be truly neutral. So that's what tech companies can do is that search engines like uh, Google, the biggest one, uh, but there are, uh, well, I'll get to that in a second, it, uh, can provide content neutral algorithms more like the old fashioned card catalog catalog at your local library, which didn't have an opinion about what you were looking for, but just simply provided a neutral resource to help you search for what you're interested in. And then the second one, which I just touched on there, is alternatives like DuckDuckGo. There are other alternative media sites, other search engines. And that's what the free market can provide, is a variety of services so that the user can decide, what do I trust the most? What is going to get me the answer? Um, I might, I'll just give a quick example. I myself am disappointed by Wikipedia. I will look at, some of it is great, but other times I'm looking at a Wikipedia article and, I'm, and I, I know from my own knowledge that this is either slanted or it's just plain wrong. <laughs> so if you can't trust it, you wanna be able to go to an alternative source and, and that's what the internet should provide. Next question, Parler tried to go without moderation and terrorists took over. How do we deal with situations like that or how should companies deal with them? So uh, this moderating? great question. And, you know, we have at Washington Policy Center, we've thought about this quite a bit because here we are trying to say, well, there should be platforms for free, free speech, but still there are problem areas uh, of speech, which again, the courts and the U.S. Constitution have recognized from the beginning. And one model to look at is the 60 year history of television, which dealt with exactly this problem. So there are standards of language, images, levels of violence, things like that, that can be shown on television. It's fairly restrictive actually. Um, the internet does not have to be that restrictive. I'm not arguing for that, but there are content neutral standards and the courts have recognized this regarding language, uh, and, and appeals to violence, particularly, or radical ideologies, uh, which have been allowed as uh, reasonable limitations on free speech. But, but th those don't have to do with the content of ideas. So the key about free speech is you should be able to express any idea you like, even the most radical, um, but not in an explicit or, or, or a way that calls for violence or harm or breaking the law. So one example is, uh, platforms would not allow, allow any content, which is illegal, just straight up. Um, and then the other historical example I'll give is even all through the Cold War, the United States never suppressed the American Communist Party. They had their own newspaper, their own radio programs. They never prevented people from literally advocating the overthrow of the U.S. government. You were allowed to express that idea, but what you could not do is engage in a violent conspiracy uh, to assassinate people or, or political figures or go against the government. That's illegal. So the reason I'm describing that line is that there is a way for a platform to create a policy which says, 
there, there are just certain illegal activities that we're not going to permit on our platform. That gives them a clear guideline, which everybody can understand. It's transparent. And then within that, all uh, ideas and viewpoints are permitted. Let's see. Well, by the way, I should add, we'll be speaking with Brandy Cruz, independent reporter coming up uh, during the noon uh, Q&A session. And I'm looking forward to that, uh, to talk to her about her own perceptions as a reporter about the media and problems within the media. Different topic than this one, but uh, obviously related in some ways. Next question for you, Paul. If we got rid of Section 230, would that lead to far more moderation, uh, i.e. censorship, by the platforms? Well, the platforms would have to decide. So if we got, and I'm not even sure if just simply repealing Section 230 is an answer straight up, because as I mentioned, Section, Section 230 was drafted in 1996 and, and the world is a lot different today. So Congress may choose to take a different approach. Uh, and there are, and again, there are bills to do that. I think Representative Crenshaw has introduced a bill that would amend or change Section 230. So there's some nuance there. But in answer to the question, uh, the, it would remove this artificial protection that the government has created for tech companies. And then consumers and users could see that companies would choose. Is a, a tech company going to operate more like a traditional newspaper where they say, this is the kind of content that we pick and choose. We have our authors. I mean, that, that's what websites do now is they, they choose what authors they're going to promote uh, post and then they uh, are responsible for that. The alternative model is for some platforms to say, we have no, we do not filter. We are a true bulletin board again, which was the idea at the beginning. We simply provide the platform. We have some professional standards that I mentioned earlier about, you can't just post any photograph up on, on our, our platform. Okay, we're gonna have some reasonable content neutral rules. You could even have platforms that say, similar to what the movie industry has done for, again, decades. We have G-rated, PG, R-rated adult content. Um, and we're gonna tell you what that is. Again, as long as it's legal, the government has a role in preventing illegal activity on the internet. But then again, the, inter the government has had that role regarding all communications, radio, television, and telephones, you can't, you can't use a telephone to plan a crime. <laughs> so the internet is like that. Uh, but going back to your main point, uh, what platforms would decide, what services would do is set, tell users, we are either completely neutral or we are providing a moderated forum and here are our rules for what kind of content we provide. And then the user would, would be able to choose. That's how a true open marketplace would work. Next question. Uh, this is from Sue. John Stossel is currently suing Facebook for defamation due to their use of third party fact checker uh, operating on opinion rather than fact basis. Do you see that litigation affecting the conversation and policy? It, it is affecting the conversation because John Stossel, who obviously has the resources, is following through on the logic of Section 230. And that is where he's saying, you are you, the platform, the tech company, are contracting with third parties to judge whether John Stossel's content is quote true or not or fact checked or what, and that is the definition of of editorial activity, which is exactly what newspapers, radio stations, TV stations, and publishing houses have been doing for many many decades. So, John Stossel is basically calling their bluff. He's saying on the one hand. You can't say that you're a neutral platform. And then on the other hand, you have this entire system of so-called fact checkers. And, and who are they? You know, like what makes them an authority to know what the truth is? Because there's, there's no way to objectively determine that. And so John Stossel is just simply pressing ahead with the logic of saying, you call them fact checkers, but what they really are, are editors. <laughs> and you're, you're editing my content. And therefore, I'm bringing a lawsuit under Section 230. That makes sense. I don't know if he's using that actual law or referring to something else, but the reasoning behind his lawsuit makes a lot of sense. And yes, it is having an impact. It's interesting. I should mention that uh, last year was the first first time WPC had one of our items, uh, some uh, uh, some research by Todd Myers, fact checked. And um, it was interesting because the so-called fact check wasn't, it didn't correct any of the facts right. of Todd Myers' research. It just said, 
we would prefer if he would emphasize this study over the other study. <laughs> and, and so it was, it was we're, we're angry that he's come to it. He's emphasized a different uh, conclusion uh, based on these facts than, than we would like you to share. So, yeah. it, so it was not a fact check at all. Not at all. And, and the thing is, these people are amateurs. OK, I mean, they are neophytes when it comes to censorship. They, uh, they're professionals who have been exercising censorship in other countries for centuries and know how to do it. The tech companies are sort of stumbling uh, because they're trying to be, you know, they're trying to do what, you know, 1984 <laughs> calls for. Um, and so that's exactly right. And of course, uh, you know, I'm the research director for everything that Todd publishes. We are very firm about having our facts right. Uh, the piece that Todd put out was factually correct. The item that they said was, quote, fact checking had nothing to do with facts. It had to do with viewpoint. And they didn't like the viewpoint that Todd had taken or the conclusions that he from, had from his research. They are, they or anybody else is perfectly welcome to dis disagree. People can have another opinion uh, alternative to what we have come up with and that's fine, we'll have a debate. But they did it under this phony guise of being so-called fact checkers and they were just old fashioned, you know, biased, in this case, left wing <laughs> uh, viewpoint that we have dealt with for many decades. So there was nothing new about it. Uh, and, and, and of course they had no case. So they eventually they had to back off, but it shows how the tech companies are trying to kind of feel their way. And they think that they're operating on some kind of high principle, but all they're doing is substituting their, their opinion for the opinion, uh, to work against opinions that they don't like. Uh, next question, is there any threat of the loss of net neutrality creating filters for politics as well as profit? Okay, can you repeat that? I'm... Is there any threat uh, from the loss of net neutrality creating filters for politics as well as uh, profit? Okay, uh, thanks for repeating it. So. This term net neutrality is kind of a technical term that refers to a different issue, but I'll just address it straight up, which is there is no net neutrality. The, the internet is, is yet another human activity. <laughs> it's, all, it's all run by people who make decisions about what is going to be on the internet. So there's nothing neutral about it, unless, again, as I said, a platform adopts a business model where they say, we don't monitor content. We are simply providing a forum. That's completely legitimate. And again, people have done that in other contexts. The for-profit part is just consumers, users voting in the marketplace. And in general, that's a good thing. And it serves the public interest because it allows, it shifts power from a central monopoly or a central bureaucracy to um, individual users. And we saw that earlier in this event with the debate over education, all that consumer choice does is empower families, in the case of education, to make choices that serve them. The internet is the same. Uh, consumer shopping choices online is a very powerful thing, and people should have as many options as possible. It's the, it's the monopoly dominance of the internet is the problem we're dealing with today. Next question, is there a free, this is from Danielle, is there a free market antidote or regulatory relaxation or reform to deal with situations like when Amazon and the app stores stopped serving and hosting Parler? In other words, industry actors with the greatest market power throttling products they believe threaten the status quo. Right, great point. So this goes to the, the key issue. If, if Amazon uh, or Google or one of these tech companies is going to present themselves as providing a service. In, in the case of Parler, they were, these companies were renting server space to a service, which they did for, they do for thousands of, of contractors. Parler was, you know, paying their bill like a utility. And then one day the, the company that was providing the service decided for purely controversial political viewpoint reasons, flip the switch and turn them off. And, and that goes back to where I started is that this is a shocking world that we live in where one company can decide, we're not gonna provide you with that service anymore and you are completely shut down. So this is a little bit like, you know, your local city government doesn't like a letter that you wrote to the editor, so they shut off the electricity at your house. <laughs> it's it's kind of like that 
where instead of providing a neutral utility service, we provide servers so you can run your website. Uh, they went, they shifted over into content management. And again, it was very wrapped up with politics as we know, but again, the, what that means from an analytical point of view is that they made the, the decision based on viewpoint. They disagreed with the opinion of Parler. And so they, they forced them to go dark and Parler didn't at that time anyway, didn't have any place else to go. Now I understand that Parler and other sites are trying to create alternatives and good for them, but that's just circles back to the central problem we have a little bit like the electricity in your house. If some powerful force decides to turn it off, there really isn't anything you can do about it. So, so there's a, a comment, um, more of than, than a question, but I'll let you um, uh, agree or disagree. The way technology is moving, hosting platforms are becoming more and more decentralized as well. So the creator of content will have more ownership of their content and companies like Amazon through AWS can't remove a site's hosting if they don't like the platform, just like with AWS taking down uh, Parler. Government action is always going to be 10 plus years behind technology and regulations end up hurting the least powerful and benefiting the most. Anything yeah. you want to add to that, Paul? Yeah, that's a, that's an astute observation because it gets at the core dynamic of what's going on. And the commenter made you know two very good key points, which helps us understand this entire situation that we're in. Number one, government is always behind what's happening in the real world. Markets are all, and society in general, by the way, is far more innovative, flexible, nimble, and moving faster than government agencies ever are. So therefore, the government should not try to interfere in positive developments that are happening in society or technology or the marketplace. And then the second thing is, because of the changes in technology, um, the ability to be on the internet is diversifying. And again, it always goes back to human nature. People say, I want to control my own deal. I, I don't want to be subject to threats or, or being shut off by some other company that I can't do anything about. So to the extent that technology allows to diversify sources on the internet, it is a good thing. And again, the the people who benefit is society in general. And, and we have this argument with the left all the time. What, what, the, what people voluntarily do in the private marketplace taken together serves the public interest. Not all, we cannot depend on government to provide us with free speech or a thousand other things that we need in our lives. This is something that civil society does voluntarily by all of us interacting together. These days, that interact, much of that interaction takes place online. So the commenter, commenter is exactly right. The more diversified power is throughout the internet, the more people are able to connect with each other without being threatened or interfered by a third party. Well, I was hoping we'd have time to comment on the uh, Public Disclosure Commission and, or, and government entities like that. Uh, and their impact on uh, on social media uh, crackdowns and uh, and limiting, but uh, we're just completely out of time, so we'll have to reserve that for uh, maybe a blog or or something along those lines. We do try to answer all questions that come in, even if we can't do it live. I can um, I can address that in one sentence as we wrap up here, if you like, Dave. Go ahead. Sure. The, anything about the PDC or this kind of reporting, people should just understand that those are all forms of government monitoring a public conversation. So it goes back to the point we said about regulation. Every time you hear about a PDC reporting requirement or Facebook shutting down so-called political ads, all of that is top-down regulation of free speech. So just so people understand what the impact is. Many thanks, uh, Paul, our Vice President for Research here at Washington Policy Center. Stay tuned. Our special virtual lunch uh, time event with independent reporter and host of Undivided, Brandy Cruz, is coming up after this short break. We'll be back with you very soon.